Murder of the Dead by Amadeo Bordiga. In Italy, we have long experience of catastrophes that strike the country, and we also have a certain specialization in staging them. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, floods, rainstorms, epidemics. The effects are indisputably felt, especially by poorer people and those living at high densities. And if cataclysms that are frequently much more terrifying strike all corners of the world, not always do such unfavorable social conditions coincide with geographical and geolog geological ones. <clears throat> but every people in every country holds its own delights. Typhoons, drought, tidal waves, famine, heat waves and frosts, all unknown to us in the garden of Europe. And when one opens the newspaper, one inevitably finds more than one item, from the Philippines to the Andes, from the polar ice cap to the African desert. Our capitalism, as has been said a hundred times over, is quantitatively small fry. But today it is in the vanguard, in a qualitative sense, of bourgeois civilization, of which it offers the greatest precursors from amidst Renaissance splendor in the masterful development of an economy based on disasters. We wouldn't dream of shedding a single tear if a monsoon washed away entire cities on the coast of the Indian Ocean, or if they were submerged by the tidal waves caused by submarine earthquakes. But we have found out how to collect alms from all over the world for the Polycene. Our monarchy was great in knowing to rush not to the dance but to where people are dying of cholera, or to the ruins of Reggio and Messina, raised to the ground by the earthquakes of 1908. Now our puffed-up president has been taken off to Sardinia, and if the Stalinists haven't been fibbing, they have shown him teams of Potemkin workers in action that then run to the other side of the stage like the warriors in Ada. It was too late to pull a homeless out of the flooding Po, but good play was made of MPs and ministers paddling about in their wellies after setting up cameras and microphones for a worldwide broadcast of their lamentations. Here we have the bright idea, the state should intervene, and we have been applying it for a good 90 years. The professedly homeless Italian has set state, uh, has set state aid in the place of the grace of God and the hand of providence. He is convinced that the national budget has much wider bounds than the compassion of our Lord. At a good Italian, sorry, a good Italian happily forks out 10,000 lire squeezed out of him so that months and months later he can squander 1,000 lire of the government's money. And during one of this, these periodic contingencies, now fashionably called emergencies, but which fall in all seasons, when the central government has scarcely initiated the unfailing provisions and fundings, a band of no less specialized homeless will roll up its sleeves and plunge into the business of procuring concessions and the orgy of contracts. The Minister of Finance of the day, Venoni, spends, or <coughs> suspends by his authority all other state functions and declares that he will not provide a single brass farther, farthing from the exchequer for all the other special acts, so that all means can be addressed to dealing with the present disaster. There could be no better proof than this, that the state serves for nothing, and that if the hand of God really did exist, he would make a splendid present to the homeless of all kinds by causing earthquakes and bankrupting this charlatan and dilettante state. The foolishness of the small and middle bourgeoisie shines forth at its brightest when it seeks a remedy for the terror that freezes it in the warm hope of a subsidy and an indemnity liberally bestowed upon it by the government. But the reaction of the overseers of the working masses who, they scream, lost everything in the disaster, but unfortunately not their chains, appears no less senseless. These leaders who pretend to be Marxists have for these supreme situations, which interrupt the well-being of the proletariat derived from normal capitalist exploitation, an economic formula even more foolish than that of state intervention. The formula is well known, make the rich pay. 
Venoni is thus reviled because he was unable to identify and tax high incomes. But a mere crumb of Marxism suffices to establish that high incomes thrive where high levels of destruction occur, big business deals being based on them. The bourgeoisie must pay for the war, stated those false shepherds in 1919, instead of inviting the proletariat to overthrow it. The Italian bourgeoisie is still here and enthusiastically invests its income in paying for wars and other disasters for which it is then repaid fourfold. Yesterday, when the catastrophe destroys houses, fields, and factories, throwing the active population out of work, it undoubtedly destroys wealth. But this cannot be remedied by a transfusion of wealth from elsewhere, as with the miserable operation of rummaging around for old jumble where the advertising, collection, and transport cost far more than the value of the worn-out clothes. The wealth that disappeared was that of past, ages-old labor. To eliminate the effect of the catastrophe, a huge mass of present-day living labor is required. So if we use the concrete social, not abstract definition of wealth, we can see it as the right of certain individuals who form the ruling class to draw on living contemporary labor. New incomes and new privileged wealth are formed in the mobilization of new labor, and the capitalist economy offers no means of shifting wealth accumulated elsewhere to plug the gap in Sardinian or Venetian wealth, just as one could not take from the banks of the Tiber to rebuild the one swallowed up by the Po. This is why it is a stupid idea to tax the ownership of the fields, houses, and factories left intact to rebuild those affected. The center of capitalism is not the ownership of such, of such investments, but a type of economy which allows the drawing from and profiting from what man's labor creates in endless cycles, subordinating the employment of this labor to that withdrawal. Thus, the idea of resolving the wartime housing crisis with an income freeze on landlords of undamaged houses led to the provision of homes in a worse condition than that caused by the bombing. But the demagogues shout easy arguments so as not to confuse the working masses. The basis of Marxist economic analysis is the distinction between dead and living labor. We do not define capitalism as the ownership of heaps of past crystallized labor, but as the right to extract from living and active labor. That is why the present economy cannot lead to a good solution. Realizing with the minimum expenditure of present labor, the rational conservation of what past labor has transmitted to us, nor to better bases for the performance of future labor. What is of interest to the bourgeois economy is the frenzy of the contemporary work rhythm, and it favors the destruction of still useful masses of past labor, not giving a to penny a penny dam for its descendants. Marx explains that the ancient economies, which were based more on use than exchange value, did not indeed did not need to extort surplus labor as much as the present one, recalling the only exception, that of the extraction of gold and silver. It is not without reason that capitalism arose from money, where the worker was forced to work himself to death, as in Diodorus Sicilis. The appetite for surplus labor not only leads to extortion from the living of so much labor as to shorten their lives, but does good business in the destruction of dead labor so as to replace still useful products with other living labor. <clears throat> like Maram Maldo, capitalism, oppressor of the living, is the murderer also of the dead. But as soon as people whose production still moves within the lower forms of slave labor corvée labor, etc., are drawn into the whirlpool of an international market dominated by the capitalist mode of production, the sale of their products for export become, becoming their principal interest, the civilized horrors of overwork are grafted on the barbaric horrors of slavery, serfdom, etc. The original title of the paragraph quoted is Der Heishunger Nack Merarbeit, <laughs> literally, the voracious appetite for surplus labor. 
Small-scale capitalism's hunger for surplus labor, as set out in our doctrine, already contains the entire analysis of the modern phase of capitalism that has grown enormously. The ravenous hunger for catastrophe and ruin. Far from being our discovery, to hell with the discoverers, especially when they sing even the scale out of tune, then believe themselves to be creators. The distinction between dead and living labor lies in the fundamental distinction between constant and variable capital. All objects produced by labor which are not for immediate consumption, but are employed in a further work process. Now one calls them producer goods, form constant capital. Therefore, whenever products enter as means of production into new labor processes, they lose their character of being products and function only as objective factors contributing to living labor. This is true for main and subsidiary raw materials, machines and all other types of plant which progressively wear out. The loss due to wear which has to be compensated for requires the capitalist to invest another quota, always of constant capital, which current economics calls amorti amortization. Depreciate rapidly, that is the supreme ideal of this grave-digging economy. We recalled a propos, the body possessed by the devil, how in Marx capital has the demon demoniacal function of incorporating living labor into dead labor, which has become a thing. What joy that the Poe's embankments are not immortal, and today one can happily incorporate living labor into them. Projects and specifications are ready in a few days. Good boys, you are possessed by the devil. Sir, the drawing office of our firm has done its duty in predisposing technical and economic studies. Here they are all nice and ready, and price analysis values the stone of Montsalus higher than Carrara marble. The property, therefore, which labor power in action, living labor, possesses of preserving value, at the same time that it adds it, is a gift of nature which costs the laborer nothing, <clears throat> but which is very advantageous to the capitalist inasmuch as it preserves the existing value of his capital. <clears throat> this value, which is simply preserved, thanks always to the operation of living labor, is called the constant part of capital or constant capital by Marx. But that part of capital represented by invested in labor power, wages, does instead in the process of production undergo an alteration of value and also produces an excess, a surplus value. We therefore call it the variable part, or simply variable capital. The key lies here. Bourgeois economics calculates profit in relation to the constant capital, which lies still and doesn't move. In fact, it would go to the devil if the labor of the worker did not preserve it. Marxist economics, on the contrary, places profit in relation only to variable capital, and demonstrates how the active labor of the proletarian a preserves constant capital dead labor and b increases variable capital living labor this increase surplus value is gained by the entrepreneur this process as marx explains of establishing the rate without taking into account constant capital is like making it equal to zero an operation current in mathematical analysis where variable quantities are concerned once constant capital is set at zero, gigantic development of profit occurs. This is the same as saying that the enterprise's profit remains if the disadvantage of maintaining constant capital is removed from the capitalist's shoulders. This hypothesis is none other than state capitalism's present reality. Transferring capital to the state means that constant capital equals zero. Nothing of the relationship between entrepreneurs and workers is changed, since this depends solely on the magnitude of variable capital and surplus value. Are analyses of state capitalism something new? Without any haughtiness, we use what we have known since 1867 at the latest. It is very short. CC equals O. <clears throat> Let us not leave Marx without this ardent passage after the cold formula. Capital is dead labor, that vampire lake only lives by sucking living labor, and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. Modern capital, which needs consumers as it needs to produce ever more, has a great interest in letting the products of dead labor fall into disuse as soon as possible, 
so as to impose the renewal with living labor, the only type from which it sucks profit. That is why it is in seventh heaven when war breaks out, and that is why it is so well trained for the practice of disasters. Car production in America is massive, but all or nearly all families have a car, so demand might be exhausted. So then it is better that the cars last only a short time. <clears throat> So that this is indeed the case, firstly, they are badly built with a series of botched parts. If the users break their necks more often, no matter, a client is lost, but there is another car to substitute. Then they call on fashion with a large, cretinizing subsidy of advertising propaganda, through which everyone wants the latest model, like the women who are ashamed to put on a dress, even if perfectly good, from last year. <clears throat> the fools are taken in, and it does not matter that a Ford built in 1920 lasts longer than a brand new 1951 model. And finally, the dumped cars are not used even for scrap and are thrown into car cemeteries. Who dares to take one saying, you have thrown it away as if it were worthless? What harm is there in me fixing and, re and reusing it? He would get a kick up the backside and a gowl sentence. To exploit living labor... Capital must destroy dead labor, which is still useful. Loving to suck warm young blood, it kills corpses. So while the maintenance of the Poe embankments for 10 kilometers requires human labor costing, let us say 1 million a year, it suits capitalism better to rebuild them all, spending 1 billion. Otherwise, it would have to wait 1,000 years. This perhaps means that the nasty fascist government sabotaged the Poe embankments? Certainly not. It means that no one has pressed for an annual budget of a miserable million that is not spent as it is swallowed up in the financing of other large-scale works of new construction, which have budget estimates of billions. Now the devil has swept away the embankments. One finds someone with the best motives of sacrosanct national interest who activates the project office and has them rebuilt. Who is to blame for preferring the large-scale projects? the fascists, and the official communists. Both of them prattle that they want a productivist, full employment policy. Productivism, Mussolini's favorite creature, consists in establishing present-day cycles of living labor, out of which big business and big speculation make billions. Let us modernize the aged machines of the great industrialists, and also let us modernize the riverbanks after letting them collapse, all at the people's expense. The history of the recent years of administrative management, of state works, and of the protection of industry is full of these masterpieces, ranging from the provision of raw materials sold below cost to works undertaken by a state monopoly in the struggle against unemployment on the basis of constant capital equals zero. In a few words, let us spend it all in wages, and since the enterprise has only shovels for equipment, the Lord is convinced that it is useful to shift earth first from here to there, then immediately back to here again. If the Lord hesitates, the enterprise has the trade union organizer to hand, a demonstration of laborers shouldering shovels under the ministry's windows and all's well. The discoverer arrives and supersedes Marx. Shovels, the only constant capital, have given birth to surplus value. Today, Undoubtedly, the size of the disaster along the Po has been massive, and the estimated cost of the damage is still rising. Let us admit that the cultivated area of Italy lost 100,000 hectares, or 1,000 square kilometers, about one three hundredth or three per thousand of the total. 100,000 inhabitants have had to leave the area, which is not the most densely settled in Italy, or, in round figures, one fifth hundred or two per thousand. If the bourgeois economy were not mad, one could do a simple little sum. The national stock has suffered a serious blow. However, the zone was only partially destroyed. When the floodwaters recede, the agricultural soil will largely be left behind, and the decomposition of vegetation along with the, deep, along with the deposition of alluvium will partially compensate for the lost fertility. If the damage is one-third of total capital, it costs one thousandth of the national capital, but this has an average income of 5% or 50 per thousand. 
If for a year every Italian saved scarcely one fiftieth of his consumption, the damage would be made good. But bourgeois society is anything but a cooperative. Even if the great freebooters of native capital escape Venoni by demonstrating that part ownership of their enterprises has been distributed among the employees, all the productivistic operations of Italian and international economy are more or less as destructive as the Paduan disaster. The water entered through one hole and left through another. Such a problem is insuperable on capitalist grounds. If it were a question of making the arms to provide Eisenhower with his hundred vi- his hundred divisions within a year, the solution would be found. These are all short cycle operations, and capitalism is as pleased as punch if the order for the ten thousand guns is with a delivery date in one hundred and not one thousand days. The steel pool does not exist without reasons, but a pool of hydrological and seismological organizations cannot be formed. At least not until the great science of the bourgeois period is really able to provoke series of floods and earthquakes like aerial bombardments. Here it is a matter of a slow, non-accelerable centuries-long transmission from generation to generation of the results of dead labor, but under the guardianship of the living, of their lives, and of their lesser sacrifice. Let us admit, for example, that the water in the Polsine. Will recede in a few months, and that the breach of Occhio Bello is closed before the spring. Only one annual harvest cycle would now be lost. No productive investment can replace it, but the loss is reduced. If instead one believes that all the Po embankments and those of the other rivers will frequently frequently come apart, due as much to the consequence consequences of overlooked maintenance. During thirty years of crisis, as to the disastrous deforestation of the mountains, then the remedy will be even slower in coming. No capital will be invested for the good of our great grandchildren. Our father wrote in vain that only a few examples of virgin forest remain, growing without the intervention of human labor. The forestry system thus becomes almost man's work, despite the minimum of capital in the operation. Nevertheless, high-growing trees, the most important in the public economy, always require a very long period before yielding a useful product. However, forestry science has shown that the best year to fell timber is not that at the end of the maximum lifespan, but that in which current growth equals average growth. One must always calculate eighty, one hundred, and even one fifty years for an oak wood. D. Vittorio and Pastor. Would fling the book if they had ever opened it out of the window. As in the operata, or operetta, steel, steel capital, love cannot wait. There is still worse to relate. Relatively little is said of the disaster in Sardinia, Calabria, and Sicily. Here, the geographical facts differed drastically. The very slack gradient of the Po Valley caused a buildup of water. Which then swamped over the clay and impermeable soils below, the same reasons in the south and the islands of high rainfall and deforestation of the mountains, along with the steep fall down to the sea, caused the destruction. The mountain streams washed sand and gravel from the bedrock, and destroyed fields and houses, all in a few hours, without, however, causing many victims. Not only is the sacking of the magnificent forests of Esprom. Aspromonti, and the Silla by the Allied liberators irreparable. But here also the renewal of the land swamped by the flood waters is practically impossibly not merely uneconomic for the the investors, and for the helpers, more self-interested than the former, if that is possible. Not only the narrow horizons of cult- cultivable soil. But also the thin, non-rocky strata that gave it weak support have been washed away, soil which was carried up many times over decades by the grindingly poor farmers. Every plantation, every tree, the basis of a rather profitable agriculture, and industry in some villages came down with the soil, and the orange and lemon trees floated out to sea. Replanting a destroyed vineyard takes about two years, but citrus plantations only provide a full harvest. A full harvest, after seven to ten years, 
and a great amount of capital is needed to establish and run them. Naturally, the good books do not give the cost of the unthinkable operation of carrying up again. For hundreds of meters, the soil brought down, and in any case, the water would carry it away again before the plant roots could fix it to the subsoil. Not even the houses can be rebuilt where they were before for technical, not economic reasons. Five or six unfortunate villages on the Ionian coast in the province of Reggio Calabria will not be rebuilt on their own hill sites, but down by the sea. In the Middle Ages, after devastation had caused the disappearance of every last trace of the magnificent coastal cities of Magna Graecia, the apex of agriculture and art in the ancient world, the poor agricultural population saved itself from Saracen pirate raids by living in villages built on the mountain tops, which were less accessible and thus more defensible. Roads and railways were built along the coast with the arrival of the Piedmontese government, and where malaria did not prohibit it, where the mountains ran down close to the sea, every village had its on sea near the station. It became so convenient to carry timber away. Tomorrow only the on seas will remain, and there they are laboriously rebuilding some houses. So what then if the peasant reclines the slope where nothing can ever take root, and the very bare and friable rock strata itself does not permit the rebuilding of houses. And the workers by the sea, what will they do? Today they can no longer emigrate, like the Calabrians of the unhealthy lowlands and the Lucanians of the damned claylands, made sterile by the greedy felling of the woodlands, which once covered the mountains and the trees that spread over the upland grazing. Certainly in such conditions, no capital and no government will intervene, a total disgrace of the obscene hypocrisy with which national and international solidarity was praised. It is not a moral or sentimental fact that underlies this, but the contradiction between the convulsive dynamic of contemporary supercapitalism and all the sound requirements for the organization of the life of human groups on the earth, allowing them to transmit good living conditions through time. Bertrand Russell, the Nobel Prize winner, who quietly pontificates in the world press, accuses man of overly sacking natural re resources, so much so that their exhaustion can already be calculated. Recognizing the fact that the great powers conduct absurd and mad policies, he denounces the aberrations of the individualist economy and tells the Irish joke, Why should I care about my descendants? What have they ever done for me? Russell counts among the aberrations, along with that of mystical fatalism, that of communism, which states, if we have done with capitalism, the problem is solved. After such a display of physical, biological, and social science, he is unable to see that it is an equally physical fact that the huge level of loss of both natural and social resources is essentially linked to a given type of production, and thinks that all would be resolved by a moral sermon or a Fabian appeal to the human wisdom of all classes. The corollary is pitiful. Science becomes impotent when it has to solve problems of the spirit. Those who really achieve human progress, taking decisive steps forward in the organization of human life, are not really the conquerors and dominators who still dare to ostinate greed for power, but the swarms of insipid benefactors and proponents of the ERP and brotherhood among peoples, like so many pacifist dovecotes, dovecots. Passing from cosmology to economics, Russell criticizes the liberal illusions in the panacea of free competition and has to admit. Marx predicted that free competition among capitalists would lead to monopoly and was proved correct when Rockefeller established a virtually mon monopol monopolistic system for oil. Starting from the solar explosion, which one day will instantaneously transform us into gas, which could prove the Irishman right, Russell finishes with maudlin sent sentiments. Nations desiring prosperity must seek collaboration more than competition. Is it not the case, Mr. Nobel Prize winner, who has written treatises on logic and scientific method, that Marx calculated the development of monopoly 50 years earlier? 
If that were good dialectics, the opposite of competition is monopoly, not collaboration. Take good note that Marx also predicted the destruction of the capitalist economy, class monopoly, not with collaboration, with which you are devoted to flattering all the Trumans and Stalins of goodwill, but with class war. Just as Rockefeller came, big moustache must come, but not from the Kremlin. That one, despite Marx, is about to shave like an American.